Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy and privilege to be serving with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life. This is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world. We are unapologetically progressive as we offer ourselves in fulfillment of this mission in welcoming people of all ethnicities and cultures, of all sexual orientations, gender identities, social and economic situations, politics and abilities, and, and we advocate for human rights and we strive to be good stewards of this earth. In living our mission, we recognize the network of relationships of which we are a part, both today and in history, as well as into the future. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They and other nations were here long before the first European settlers came down the river. And we honor the Peoria people as we gather and worship. We honor them for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank folks for joining us in person and online. One of the great lessons of the last few years is how precious it is to come together, to be with other people, to expand our circles of care and kindness. So if you are new to us, please help us get to know you. We have an abundance of name tags. I want to thank all of our greeters and ushers for all the good work they do every Sunday. And please ask all the questions, make observations, wonder, and ask us, because we love the conversation. Stay for visiting on the patio after service or in Fellowship Hall after service, or also if you're joining us on Zoom, by all means, stay and visit there as well. And as we gather, I want to invite folks to turn your respective devices to worship mode, whether that is silent or buzzy. If you are someone who has some challenges with figuring that out, we have a worship mode ministry. Please feel free to ask. We can get you some help because I know mine's a little confusing as well sometimes. I have a couple of notes for today. One is that we have our connections fair today after the service. This is an opportunity to get to know some of the uh, very active congregation uh, communities, committees, there we go, committees and groups and programs that are part of this congregation um, and meet some of the volunteers and see if there's a place where you might find a good match for what you'd like to be doing uh, in this congregation. Also, after the service on the patio will be a planning meeting for the Haunted Forest. Yes, if you are new to this congregation, let me tell you, this is becoming a thing. Um, there is a great team working on planning the next way to transform the trails in the woods into a larger-than-life Halloween experience. I think that's actually not exaggerating. Um, and we've done a, a great job the last couple of years and we want to keep going. This is the third year of a really remarkable public event that we have a unique opportunity to create. We had something like, what, four, 500, 300 people come through last year? 500 people come through our haunted forest last year alone. Wow. Wow. And like five times that much candy, I think, was handed out. So, I mean, really, it's the place to be. And more help is welcome and encouraged. I also want to point you to Natasha Green for being a contact for that. Um, and we, have, we need lots of people to help make it happen. In two weeks, I want to just kind of offer this note, a particular ministry of our congregation at this point. In two weeks on Sunday, October 8th at 2 p.m., we will host the Drag Story Time, Unicorns at the UU Church. So I want to invite folks to join us, bring family and friends. This is an all-ages, family-friendly event. This is with performer Juju Holiday, uh, And we want a little bit of RSVP so we can have the right amount of craft supplies um, to go with that. All right. I think those are good for what's coming up. And right now I want to turn to part of what we're getting ready for and beginning this fall, which is restarting, uh, refreshing our covenant circles. Now, our covenant circles are small groups um, of people who gather about four, five, six, ten or so. Get to know, it's a way for people to get to know a smaller group 
um, of folks within the congregation. And they meet twice a month. There's a range of times, uh, dates and times at which those meetings happen. And folks are placed into one group uh, running for about the church here. And those groups, within them, there's reflection, there's sharing, there's discussion. And I want to thank uh, Sarah Allen for getting two messages from members for today on what their covenant groups mean to them. So we're going to let those speak for themselves. Um, I want to, let's hear from Bob Dearborn first and then Kathy McNeil. I like being a member of our covenant circle because it allows me the chance to interact and share with others and get to know them on a deeper level than normal. I especially like our check-in time where we take turns each having a chance to share uninterrupted. In essence, for me, our covenant circles, um, the essence is the non-judgmental atmosphere we create, which allows us to truly connect with each other and get to know each other. Um, allows me to feel accepted as I am and to accept others just as they are, and that's important to me. I love my covenant circle. I love that I can be venting my concerns and knowing that it's okay, it's a safe place. And then also listen to other people's concerns and how they handle them, how they find solutions and even give them some ideas that I have for them. And I love the fact that I'm making new friends, friends that I can feel close to and people that I can be friends. And also, I love that when I leave my covenant circle, I really feel like it's a, it's a great way to get to know what things I can do more for my congregation, my family, my loved ones, and my whole community. And that's why I love my covenant circle. All right. Thank you, Bob and Kathy, for such beautiful messages. If you would like to know more about our Covenant Circles, we are gathering them. We'll have Joyce Rosenberger is here. Uh, we'll be able to answer any questions. You might have seen the display that we have about that. So I really want to encourage folks to think about that and adding that to your practice and connection with the congregation. And now I want to invite us further into worship. This is our opening hymn, number 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. Please rise and body your spirit. We will sing all the verses with spirit. I want to invite Sarah Allen forward to offer our opening words.
Good morning. This is a theology of welcome by Reverend Dr. David Breeden. Let's be the welcome we crave, open hearts, arms outstretched. Let's embody radical welcome, unquestioning love. Let's be the welcome we crave, deeply hearing voices and hearts. Let's be the welcome we crave, enriching understanding. Whoops. Let's embody the community we crave. And let me invite Becca Lachlan forward for our chalice lighting. For every time we make a steak by Maureen Killoran. For every time we make a mistake and we decide to start again, we light this chalice. For every time we are lonely and we let someone be our friend, we light this chalice. For every time we are disappointed and we choose to hope, we light this chalice. Last week, last weekend through this weekend are the High Holy Days in Judaism. They began with Rosh Hashanah, the start of the new year, the days of awe. So as we enter into our time of candles for joys and sorrows, I invite us first into awe. The same forces that created the universe, our sun, our planet, our bodies, our lives, those same forces are still at work. We are part of a phenomenal living system from the cosmos to the little ridges on our fingers. 
So I invite us first into awe. And I also invite us into contemplation. With Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, we consider our hearts and our actions. We consider the forgotten or the neglected parts, what is broken within us and what might be broken because of us. In this moment, I invite us into contemplation. What needs reckoning and healing? We enter this moment of meditation with the fullness of our lives. All are welcome to come forward and light candles, and we will light candles on behalf of those joining us online as well. I invite us into candles and meditation.
we pause, balanced in the center between the longest and shortest days. This is equinox. The wheel of the year turns and turns again. The air cools, days shorten, the sun seems to weaken, barely clearing the horizon after rising before beginning its descent. This is our opportunity now to pause, balanced breathing in, breathing out, knowing this present moment. For this present moment is what we are guaranteed. Like the sun moving toward its shortest day, each moment arises and is gone before we know it. This is the time to pause and consider as we enter the season of contemplation, of increasing darkness, of lying fallow, of dormancy. This is the season of letting go, of lightening burdens, preparing for the long period of being still and going deep. In the spirit of the season of contemplation, we enter into sharing from our circle today. I want to start with two joys. One, for the trail work done yesterday morning um, out yonder, they got it completely mulched. Oh my gosh, do you know? Have you hauled mulch? Do you know how much mulch that was? This is remarkable. And it was something along the lines of eight people gathered to do the work yesterday morning. Um, it was beautiful weather, and there's a lot of turkey tail mushrooms not far from the entrance to the trail. Go out and check. This is a beautiful day. Also want to share the joy from the cups potluck that was last night in honor of Mabin. Uh, they had an abundance of donations for the porch pantry, for the food pantry. Uh, I think they had about 40 people. It looked like a lot of very good food and beautiful decorations. So wonderful joy from uh, the Cups community as well. And I want to offer a note for health and recovery. Uh, we offer wishes to for health to Reverend Gianni Foliano. Gianni recently had surgery and a short stay in the hospital. They are recovering well at home in the good care of their family. And now I want to offer us to turn to one more moment for the joys, the sorrows, the names, the milestones that are within us, that are around us, that are in our minds and on our hearts. Let us hold them in this wide, wide circle of care. Bring them present. Know that they're also held in compassion. Let us close one more moment with quiet and with attending to our breath. Shalom, amen, and blessed be. And now let us turn to our story for the day. This morning we have a story about a feast, kind of like we had last night, but different. When you have more than enough. Once upon a time, there was a family. Maybe this family had not quite enough to eat. Or maybe they had just enough. Or maybe they had more than enough. You might not have been able to tell. They might not have been able to tell. Sometimes, it's hard to know if you have enough or not. It's hard not to want more or different things than what you have. In any case, this family came together one autumn day for a celebration 
a time of gratitude. They gathered, as we have done, around a table. There was food, there was drink, there were flowers and decorations. And then there was a call from the gate outside. Hello. Hello. We're hungry and thirsty. We see you have a feast. May we come in? Well, the family didn't know how to answer. Who were these people at the gate? Was it safe to let these people in? Do we have enough to share? Is there room? But then the family remembered. They remembered that most of them had come to this place from somewhere else. They remembered that even they who were at this table had not always been kind to one another. There had been times when they hurt each other. There were still times when they were sad or angry. There's no way to make life 100% safe. They remembered when each new family member had come to be with them, had been born into the family or married in. They remembered that in all those times, they could scoot over and make a little more room. And they remembered an old saying that when you have more than you need, it is better to build a longer table than to build a higher wall. We have enough, they said. We might have more than enough. We are many and we are strong and we can hold space here for all who come. And so they went out of their door to the gate and the fence and they opened the gate and invited the people who were there. Inside, the family pulled up another table and they found some more chairs and stools. And the newcomers joined them at their table and they brought out a dish full of something fragrant and delicious. And it was strange and wonderful to the family that was already there. And everyone shared and there was enough. I want us to notice, I just told one side of the story. I wonder what the story of those on the other side of the fence would be. We don't know who they are or what they bring to the table. I want us to wonder when we hear stories what's happening on the other side of them and wonder whose stories we don't hear. I can't wait to see what we all bring to this church table. The kids are invited now to join me as we head out to religious education. My colleague, the Reverend Heather Christensen, Christensen reminds us that Unitarian Universalism is a grand vision of a world filled with peace and justice, love and joy. And that vision is embodied in a few really big congregations, numerous mid-sized congregations like us, and many, many small congregations. 
But no matter the size, every congregation depends on its members and friends. Each one of us, our commitment of time and energy and resources helps make this grand vision real. So individually and together, as Unitarian Universalists, we are building a world filled with peace and love and hope and joy. So this is the time for our offering, but I also want to let you know we practice a share of the plate effort, which is that we take one, uh, a third of the undesignated plate. Like if it's for your pledge, it's for your pledge. But a third of the undesignated plate, uh, plate every week to a particular recipient, uh, local, and for September, uh, it's Look, It's My Book, which provides books for our public elementary schools in particular. And I went to their site and it was reminding me that about 75% of uh, the children in our public schools live in poverty. And the Literacy Council indicates that 61% of children living in poverty don't have a book at home. And they're more likely to read and reread books they choose themselves. And so how essential reading is in the earliest stages of life. So look, it's my book, supports our elementary reading and provides books to all 13 of the primary schools in Peoria as well as other focused programs. So please join me in expressing our gratitude and our commitment to living our mission through a financial gift we'll receive in the collection and yet again practice giving during worship as a tangible, intentional act. So one third of the undesignated plate goes to uh, the, look, it's my book, two thirds go to, to the church. Uh, please indicate that on your offering. And if you also are welcome to go to the QR code in the order of service, uh, if you'd like to give electronically. And now the ushers will pass the plates. Will the ushers please come forward?
A Litany of Wholeheartedness by Reverend Don Ski Cooley. Because there have been times when shame has crushed our ability to be wholehearted. We let go of who we ought to be and embrace who we are. Because we have not always had the courage to be imperfect, we let go of who we ought to be and embrace who we are. Because we have not always had the courage to be imperfect, we let go of who we ought to be and embrace who we are. Because we have struggled to have compassion for ourselves or others, we let go of who we ought to be and embrace who we are. Because we have been afraid of our own vulnerability, we let go of who we ought to be and embrace who we are. Because we are sometimes too scared to live authentically, we let go of who we ought to be and embrace who we are. Because we want to be wholehearted people, confident in our worthiness and our belonging. We let go of who we ought to be and embrace who we are. Please rise and body your spirit and join me for our hymn number 123, Spirit of Life. Please be seated. I'd like to begin by asking for you to think about what has been, when have you had an experience of a powerful welcome? When have you had an experience of a powerful welcome? Not necessarily comfortable. I'm just, you know. There's range, but something that really was really remarkable to you or really touched your heart. When have you had an experience of a powerful welcome? Yes, Sarah. When Warren Harris invited you to the church? Yeah. Tim? Tim? First time to coming to this church. Mm -hmm. Well, it's Steve. The final ceremony, Curcio at St. Mary's. Mm -hmm. Yes. When Michael, when Reverend Michael Brown married you, when you could become legally married, and it was in this sanctuary. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Yes. 
when you saw the signs out front. All right. Thank you. So one of the ones that I had most recently, we've shared a little bit, but I want to go a little bit deeper with this. Um, so just this August, a number of us, uh, 17, 18, 19 or so, went to the Parliament of the World Religions. And one of the features of that event is the uh, langar offered by the Sikh community. Um, and it's entirely free. It's open to everyone and anyone. It is a vegetarian meal that is made is a, at the core of their spiritual practice and their understanding of what they are about in the world, the sick community. And we were made to be entirely welcome um, and, and totally invited. And you're truly entering someone else's space. So I would say I'm not, wasn't entirely sure what was going on when it's going in. You enter and wash your hands and take off your shoes and you want to make sure your head is covered. If you don't have a scarf, they will, they will have, they have a whole pot, uh, bunch of women right at the front to help tie headscarves on um, so they can make it easy for people to participate. And you, then they point you to a place at the floor. Uh, and if you can't sit on the floor, they have tables. And then you get to try foods. They come around with large buckets of food and dole out a serving or so. And, uh, and for me, it was lovely and wonderful. And I enjoy the, the, the kind of the Indian cuisine. But it's a bunch of it. It was foods I wouldn't normally eat um, either. So the whole experience of being there was this powerful, to me, a powerful experience of trust, of trusting that the space is prepared, of relying on, they were relying on centuries of practice, centuries of practice to know how to do this. They have done this for probably billions of people around the world over all this time. And it was encouraged as a part of, you know, in Parliament, there was a lot of talk about different elements of the world and spirituality and world religions. But this was experience. This was a, a embodied moment. And I could also trust that this was the thing to do because there were hundreds of other people lined up to get on in. It was a gathering of equals. You were sitting with people of all cultures and stations. And... It was also a moment of kind of realness. The very first day of uh, the lunch offered at Parliament, it rained. I mean, it poured. And we're outside in, big, in a big, big tent, clearly made for this purpose, but I think tents have, you know, limitations. And so there were unintended waterfalls inside, uh, if you might can, understand, can imagine that. And they were trying so hard, and it kept raining. And the water just came in, and no matter how many buckets, it soaked yards of the carpet where people were supposed to sit. And they had to lay down new carpet later in, for the next day because none of it dried out. I mean, it was a lot. It was a lot to just watch and feel a whole lot of compassion for them. But all through this, all through the logistics and the people and so on. They were kind and helpful and practical and informational. They had things that explained what this was about, about their tradition. It was a little bit of geeking out with the history of coins in the Sikh community, in the Sikh culture. It was cultural pride on its own and parallel to what I knew of the Western European civilization. And it was truly a humbling reminder in a good way that the Western world is not the only world in town. There was a beautiful illustrated book of sacred text and conversation with a member of the community and was such a culturally very different experience. And here was an elder uh, sick gentleman with a turban and an abundant beard, glorious beard, talking with myself and a colleague, two women who are Unitarian Universalist ministers. And after all that, I went back every day. And I was not the same as when I entered. Because in each moment, each time, 
was yet another reinforcement of care and respect and a model of what it means to be of service. In our Western religious tradition, radical hospitality comes to us primarily through the Christian monk, St. Benedict. He took instruction from Jesus and the Bible and established a deep and powerful practice of welcome. And providing this was offering a safe place to eat and a safe place to rest. This was a matter of life and death for travelers, for pilgrims, for migrants, and more. And in the Benedictine tradition, offering hospitality was a call from God. It was sacred work, as important as prayer and meditation it was. It is one of their core spiritual practices. And I want to offer that as not just a lightly said phrase, but this is the core of their of their heart and faith. In more contemporary thought, Lonnie Collins Pratt and Father Daniel Homan explain the practice and its potential in their book, Radical Hospitality, Benedict's Way of Love. They point out that our essential cry is humanity, that we cry out in every moment, I am not an animal, I am human. I am not a street person. I am not a token. I am not a statistic. I am not a divorcee. I am not an AIDS patient. I am not a sex object. I am not a laborer. I'm not an at-risk kid. I have a mind. I have a heart. I have a soul. I dream. I feel. I care. I am a human being. They say, they remind us that hospitality has this inescapable moral dimension to it. It is not a mere social grace. It is a spiritual and ethical issue. It is an issue involving what it means to be human. So all of our talk about hospitable openness, about welcome, doesn't mean anything as long as people continue to be tossed aside, they say. They go on to point out that in a 1982 report, one ethicist said, the opposite of cruelty is not simply freedom from the cruel relationship, it is hospitality. Hospitality puts an end to injustice. It is, an, it is a moral practice, uh, it is a spiritual practice, a way of becoming more human ourselves in the practice, a way of understanding yourself. Hospitality is both the answer to modern alienation and injustice and a path to deeper spirituality. I've been learning about the way of St. Benedict and that kind of hospitality since the very earliest teachings of my divinity school experience. So we've been working on this for quite some time. And I will offer that we have, can have a deeper understanding of it, um, this question of justice and humanity and the intersection of that. Because some of you may have heard uh, those of us who participated in Parliament you know, talk about the languor and the sick experience. But I want to offer also that the languor is not done in a vacuum. Uh, there is a full range of political history in this context of uh, most of the people, most of the Sikh community people who were creating the languor came from Britain, which has its own powerful history of racial oppression and bias um, and colonization. And the context of having such a beautiful community is also done knowing that that community has been attacked in this country more recently and in ways that are deadly and heartbreaking and violating. So to be able to keep recognizing humanity and act from that is entirely within the, the whole range of context of our human 
experience. That's why it's not just a lunch. It is a witness and justice in action. And they are still, as the Sikh community, I imagine they will keep finding a way and keep practicing and keep being so generous in the way that they do. The practice of a radical welcome, a radical welcome is one in terms of a word, that radical part goes back to the 1300s in Latin. Uh, think radish, right? The radish, the root that grows underground is the same kind of word. It's something that originates in the ground. It is vital to life. And so far in our contemporary meaning, it is very much getting at the core, the root of what's so important and also doing something that will shift and be powerfully different as well, will not be the same once we put that in motion. So the radical welcome, as we talk about it often now, uh, John, Reverend John Morehouse reminds us, the radical welcoming grew out of the progressive Christian church and has come to embrace all who want religion to be meaningful in a new way. As we practice it in our religious institutions, radical welcome is how to embrace all who want religion to be meaningful in a new way. And we're reminded of that, how important that is in our Unitarian Universalist conversations when we welcome folks in. Uh, my colleague Lisa Presley captures this common experience, which is when folks who have never heard about Unitarian Universalism find our way into the, you find their way into our Unitarian Universalist congregations, so many will have this experience of, I'm home. I am home, finally. And then that's often accompanied by the question, why didn't anybody tell me about this before? Who's had that experience? I'm home, and why not earlier? Being radically welcoming means that we understand we are a great fit for so many people. And we're not going to just be willing to let in people who are like us, but find ways We've been practicing and practicing and practicing, and clearly we have room to grow, but we're going to keep practicing. We find ways to make sure we welcome all people to the best of our ability so that we don't have to hide yourself. What a powerful gift of recognizing and practicing the recognition of our universal humanity. Our universal humanity. And this congregation is moving into more of that work, of more of that visibility, more of that faith in action, that love in action. Because a year ago, last winter or so, in an effort to make a statement about this congregation and be more distinctive at, say, pride events locally, folks came up with a design for the t-shirt. Welcome home. Welcome home. We like this home thing. Okay. And it's the colors of the progressive pride flag, the rainbow, plus pink and blue for trans folks, and brown and black for black, indigenous, and people of color folks. And along with it is, and the church name, always a good thing to remember, is open minds, loving hearts, helping hands. So this congregation is kind of opening that door a little bit to being more about the radical welcome, putting it out there publicly, visibly. Because it's the right thing to do, as I think I've heard many of you say, in one way, shape, or form, but also because it's the core of our practice as well. 
if we are based in love, if we are based in recognizing our essential humanity, our inherent worth, then we too will be radically welcoming. And we have to navigate that. We have to navigate how we are practicing and inviting folks in recognizing that we too are fully human and not going to be the same after we as we are doing all this welcoming every person who comes in changes the body of the congregation so we're going to always have to navigate who is here and how we show up this is part of that practice that context so I'm reminded in our question box sermon a few weeks ago, we have the full range of theology going on in here. And in the big tent of the church, we have the full range. We have folks who deeply want to hear about God, to hear about the Christian message, to hear about a spiritual path and reflection. We have folks who want nothing to do with God and truly in no way, shape, or form, want nothing to do with God for various reasons, some of which are like, this doesn't make sense to me, I see no place for God, and some of which is deeply, deeply painful religious trauma, honestly come by. And then we have folks who are exploring different religious traditions. We have Buddhism, we have Tao, we have the earth-centered traditions, we have the pagan community, so really the sphere of religious experience. It's not a line. It is a sphere in 360. And we're navigating it all amongst ourselves. What people have found, what people have left or let go, and what still hurts from religious pain and past. What really ticks us off about institutional religions, I know it does, some of you, some of me too. And maybe it doesn't tick you off, but we feel deeply ambivalent about religious institutions, but we still need people. Boy, that's hard to navigate, huh? It's good to be together. I'm not sure about it, but it's really good to be together. together. And we find the way through that holds ourselves and each other with compassion and calls us on. I love how it brought out in the story that navigating that ambivalence about, I'm not sure how to do this, I'm not sure that we have room, how do we welcome people? And as you've heard in the story that so many of them came from someplace else before getting here. To remember that even they who were at the table, who were here, have not always been kind, still not always kind, still hurt each other make each other angry or sad or afraid. Yeah, we do that. We do that. And yet, we also remember when we've found a way to apologize, to ask forgiveness, to offer forgiveness, and then rejoice when people come in again and there's a marriage or a child or just more people and remember how good it is in the immediate moment, how good it is to welcome and say yes and build the longer table instead of the higher fence. That radical welcome is us living in practice in the immediate moment of our hearts and in the long legacy of a body such as this that we might have a long future for those who will come we will never meet. A radical welcome is much more than friendliness. It's much more than simply an invitation. It is what happens when we are willing to change and be transformed by relationships across lines of difference. Across lines of difference. We seek ways for all of us from whatever location we come, all the layers of our intersecting locations, to fully participate in the life of the congregation, that everyone, everyone who is, con is coming into contact with this body helps shape and nurture the mission 
So the congregation is constantly being made anew. We as humans know ourselves and each other as fully, fully human, as needy and flawed and difficult and inconvenient. And hospitality and a deep welcome is a way of becoming more human, of understanding our neighbors and understanding ourselves. It is that, as the authors say, the answer to modern alienation and injustice and a path to deeper spirituality. I so appreciate this radical welcome as a phrase. It feels more accessible. It feels like I can say welcome. A chance to live into the mission of growing and helping to heal the world, of living into an abundant love. And always, always with the chance to turn again toward love. Each moment of welcome is a chance to turn again toward love. So I invite us to consider how we will be, how to further enact that love, how we further practice and deepen in all the seasons, in this season of equinox and shift in this, sequence, in this season of Yom Kippur and reflection and how do we turn again in this moment of shift and change within the congregation itself, growing and seeking new ways and wonderful places to be. Let us offer ourselves in this moment and turn and love again. Amen. Please rise with me in body or spirit to our closing hymn, number 407. We're going to sit at the welcome table. Chalice Extinguishing, Kindle Nude Sparks by Deborah Burrell. We have basked in the warmth and beauty of this flame and this community. A chalice flame is extinguished. Let's carry its glow within. Let us kindle new sparks within these walls and beyond. Amen. Be ours a religion which, like sunshine, goes everywhere. Its temple all space, its shrine the good heart, its creed all truth, its ritual works of love, and its profession of faith divine living. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>